Hi there, this is Mrs. Poindexter. This is going to be just a quick overview of some important points about the endocrine function and disorders. So some slides I will not spend a lot of time on. Um, if you need to, uh, you can go back and look at the PowerPoint yourself. These are going to be the different uh, organs affected by the endocrine system. And just for this course, I do not um, focus a lot on the um, hormones that affect the sex organs. Patient assessment uh, can be very difficult when we talk about the endocrine system, uh, simply for the fact that a lot of the symptoms um, can be the result of other disorders, so a lot of times lab work is going to be needed to determine any hormonal changes. So talking about pituitary disorders, uh, typically is going to be either an over-secretion or under-secretion from the anterior pituitary or the posterior pituitary. And like I said too, when learning and memorizing for tests, just remember the posterior pituitary stores ADH. And if you see questions on other hormones uh, for our exam, you should know that it's going to be coming from the anterior pituitary. Most problems are going to be a result of a tumor. They're usually benign. Uh, some of the signs and symptoms are going to be headache and visual changes. There's going to be a sense of pressure. The things that you need to know, obviously, that if somebody has a tumor, that it's going to have to be removed through a procedure called hypophenosectomy. The ocrinotide. Um, is going to be a medication used to control um, a lot of the symptoms ahead of time. So really from a nursing standpoint is going to be more about how are you going to educate a patient uh, before the surgery and after. So the way that the surgery is done is through the transvenous transphenoidal removal, which is going to be up through the nares. Um, things that you need to talk to a patient about is ways to um, reduce the increase of intracranial pressure uh, preoperatively. Uh, pre so talk to the patient about not bending over, not straining to go to the restroom, if they need to use medications like Colace, Miralax, um, milk magnesia. Head of the bed should be 15-30 degrees to help reduce that intracranial pressure and try to keep the body midline to avoid any neck vein compression. And postoperatively, um, should talk to patients about not coughing, blowing their nose, sucking through a straw, or trying to refrain from sneezing. And you want to monitor for some um, cerebral spinal fluid leaks. You want to look for uh, clear drainage from the nose or ear and do what's called the halo ring test. When there's any drainage for, from the ear or the nose, when it dries, uh, the glucose in the, the cerebral spinal fluid will be slightly discolored yellow. Other things, uh, just because since the surgery is done up through the nose, um, you want to do oral care every four hours and watch their weights uh, since they are at an increased risk for diabetes and syphilis. So one of the conditions um, that can be a result of a pituitary disorder is going to be Cushing's. You will see this later on as just a problem of the adrenal glands. But if there is a problem from the pituitary, it's going to be an over-secretion of the ACTH, which is the adrenocorticotropic hormone, and that's going to be coming from your anterior pituitary. What you should look at, since this is basically an overproduction um, to stimulate the adrenal cortex to produce cortisol. Cortisol is a steroid, so think of the issues that patients have with long-term steroid use. Um, this is going to put them at increased risk of um, infection. You need to talk to them about safety since it increases the risk of osteoporosis. Uh, skin integrity, it thins it out quite a bit. And also um, physically how it changes the body. Um, they can have this moon face, like a, a fat pad on the back, which has been referred to sometimes as a buffalo hump. 
um, edema, thinning of the extremities. There can be sometimes GI distress, um, bruising, uh, petechia very easily, um, and of course uh, hyperglycemia since the uh, cortisol um, interrupts um, the use of insulin and overproduction, um, release of glucose from the liver through the um, gluconeogenesis. So is the following statement true or false? Only thing you really need to know about agromegaly is going to be a condition that is more predominantly seen when there's a pituitary tumor that um, affects a person in adulthood um, versus when somebody is a child that is known as gigantism. This is going to be an over-secretion of growth hormone from the anterior pituitary. Diabetes insipidus, uh, this is going to be when there is an under secretion of ADH from the posterior pituitary. So just think about it, if your body is not making enough of the antidiuretic hormone, there's nothing regulating your body's fluid. So the biggest um, symptom you're going to see is anywhere from 3 to 20 liters of urine produced per day. Because of that, um, because of all that diuresis going on, going to see a lower specific gravity, um, osmolarity, hypovolemia, increased thirst, tachycardia, and decreased blood pressure. So from a nursing standpoint, it's all going to be about fluid replacement, um, monitoring fluids, watching their neurostatus, um, monitoring the vital signs and the mucous membranes. So this is going to be a person that if it's severe enough, you're going to be signs and symptoms of fluid volume deficit. It can be from a head trauma, pituitary tumor, or um, some trauma during a, a craniotomy. There are three types. You really don't need to know this for testing purposes, but just know that the etiology can vary. And based on the etiology, will kind of dictate um, how it's managed. Signs and symptoms, again, think of fluid volume deficit. Uh, large will lose large amounts of dilute urine. Um, they can have some nocturia. It's going to have a decrease, a decrease specific gravity. Um, signs and symptoms, the fluid volume deficit, an increase um, serum osmolarity greater than 300. They're going to be thirsty. Um, vasopressin challenge tests and the fluid deprivation test are going to be a few that are used to diagnose. Treatments are going to replace the ADH and that's going to be through vasopressin. That can be done either intranasally or IM. And here's a check your understanding question. So um, when we talk about diabetes insipidus, losing tons of fluid, here is the flip of the coin, which is going to be syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, or SIADH. So this is when somebody has too much um, ADH on board. So they have too much fluid, um, extremely high um, blood pressure, they're tachycardic, they're going to have an increased specific gravity, it's going to be high, they're going to have very concentrated urine, it's going to be dark, dark, and this patient is actually going to need a fluid restriction. Um, and because of all this fluid retained, um, they may have subsequent sodium deficit of the dilutional hyponatremia, um, especially when the serum osmolarity is greater than 275, uh, which is going to uh, lead a person to have those low sodium levels, which obviously is going to put them at risk for seizure. So um, etiology um, can vary. It can be from head trauma to tumor to infections. Certain medications can precipitate it. So your signs and symptoms, uh, which is going to be opposite of diabetes insipidus, now we're going to be looking for symptoms of fluid volume overload. Um, watch for signs and symptoms of hypokalemia um, as well. You're going to see um, hyponatremia, um, excuse me, um, I said kalemia, I meant natremia, so hyponatremia, not um, 
forget what I said about potassium. Decrease uh, serum osmolarity, increase urine osmolarity. Um, and if they have severe hyponatremia, um, then obviously their symptoms are going to be more severe weight gain and then, then changes in their level of consciousness. Because of the problems with having low calcium levels, they could be at risk for seizure, seizures. So seizure uh, precautions may be enacted. And a way to replace that is going to be through a hypertonic solution of 3% um, sodium chloride. So check your understanding. So if you need to take a quick little break, now would be a good time. Here is a great comic um, between the uh, thyroid and um, I don't know what that little guy is. Might be a red blood cell. I don't know. But thyroid, obviously, believe he's king. So let's get into thyroid disorders. All right. So these are going to be more common. Um, again, if you look at problems with thyroid, these symptoms can coincide with other conditions. So again, it's going to be lab work we're going to need to take a look at. Here are your um, signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism. And remember, again, we're talking about metabolism. So think of everything just kind of slowing down. Um, you're going to have hair loss, um, lethargy, dry skin, body aches, constipation, anorexia, um, fatigue, slow speech, um, intolerance to cold. Um, in the late clinicals, you're going to have a subnormal temp, so even their temperature starts to drop, bradycardia, weight gain, um, decreased level of consciousness and also cardiac complications. So this could be when there's a decrease in T3 and T4, which are considered our thyroid hormones, with a high TSH level. And that's simply because the TSH coming from the uh, pituitary um, is keep sending the signal to the thyroid to produce the thyroid hormones, but it's not picking up the message, so it just kind of keeps flooding the system with it. And so, like I said, those early and late symptoms. When it is autoimmune, it's considered or is called Hashimoto's. Um, it can be caused by some other um, other ways that it can happen. Risk factors, um, unfortunately, women are more prone to it between ages of 30 and 60, um, and screening should be made for women over the age 50 if they have one or more of the symptoms present. The most extreme severe stage of um, hypothyroidism is going to be a mexedema coma. Um, this is basically, um, if you think metabolism slowing down to a complete halt, um, you'll see a slow decrease from respiratory drive all the way down um, to retention of CO2, which can lead to necrosis and coma. Um, obviously, it is a medical emergency, and unfortunately, there is a high mortality rate with this. Medical treatment just for hypothyroidism in general is going to be hormone, lifelong hormone replacement. This is going to be something that might be difficult for patients to manage or comprehend, and so there's an adjustment period for the fact that they have to take a hormone supplement for the rest of their life. It's going to be synthetic levothyroxine, um, or Synthroid, which is the brand name. Um, for elderly patients, you will want to do some cardiac monitoring um, just because long standing can lead to some cardiovascular issues. So, again, um, rule of thumb with our elder, elderly population is to start low and go slow. Um, in terms of our other patients, uh, from a nursing standpoint, make sure to do medication ed education with them and know these um, areas uh, highlighted in red here in terms of talking points or teaching points. Check your understanding. So you want to make sure that they take their medication on an empty stomach. The flip of this coin is going to be your hyperthyroidism. So we're talking about me uh, metabolism. Think of everything revved up um, from intolerance to heat, bulging eyes, facial flushing, enlarged thyroid, tachycardia, increased systolic blood pressure, 
weight loss, increase in diarrhea, uh, tremors, finger clubbing, and this obviously is going to be an overproduction of T3 and T4 or both by the thyroid. The autoimmune version of this is going to be Graves' disease. So remember, like I said, you're going to run yourself into a grave. And then, of course, the life-threatening condition is considered a thyroid storm. Um, patients are going to basically get the super charge exaggeration of all of these symptoms. So you're going to have a high fever, significant tachycardia, um, weight loss, abdominal pain, diarrhea, um, cardiovascular with edema and chest pain palpitations. They can also appear uh, delirious or be in a state of psychosis. So just imagine how you're going to manage a patient if you were to see them come into an emergency room. So treatment um, is going to depend um, for Graves' disease. Most common is radioactive iodine. Um, the advantage is that it avoids a lot of the side effects that go along with antithyroid medications, but of course um, destroying the thyroid tissue will result in hypothyroidism, so the patient will end up needing to be on lifelong thyroid replacement like levothyroxine or Zinthroid. Antithyroid drug um, hormones um, like the metamethazole or PTU, um, the most uh, severe toxic side effect is going to be the granulocytosis. Um, and then, of course, treatment can be just removing the thyroid itself. So the big thing you want to talk to patients about with hyperthyroidism is going to be about proper nutrition, uh, nutrition um, providing them calm and quiet environment, watching their body temp, glucose monitoring, eye care, and basically uh, signs and symptoms of infection while on an antithyroid drug therapy. Things you need to know in treatment of a thyroid storm is going to be those in red here. Um, big thing is you want to um, lower body temp, lower heart rate, and help prevent vascular collapse. So make sure you've um, kind of gone through these and you have a good sense of why they're being used. Cause of goiters. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison between hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism. So which medication should you not use? Hopefully, remember it's aspirins. So our parathyroid disorders, remember this is going to um, regulate uh, calcium in the body. So here is a good model that just kind of goes through how that happens. Take a few minutes to look it over. So this is going to be um, hyperparathyroidism is when there's an excess of parathyroid hormone that can lead to increased serum calcium levels, which is greater than 10.5. Two ways it can be either primary or secondary. Signs and symptoms that you just need to remember are going to be your stones, bones, moans, groans. Treatment, hydration therapy, increased fluid intake, um, the cranberry juice to lower the urine pH. You're going to need to take 100% um, pure cranberry. Stay away from uh, the cocktails that have uh, fruit, fructose in it. Avoid thiazide diuretics because they can actually decrease the excretion um, of calcium. Big things you want to talk to your patients about is to avoid dehydration. Um, educate them about the signs and symptoms of renal calculi or stones and encourage mobility. Our hypoparathyroidism is going to focus around low calcium levels. And our signs and symptoms are going to be our cats of the hypocalcemia, which is convulsions, arrhythmia, tetany or tingling, spasms, and stridor. So make sure you just know what your ranges are for high and low calcium levels. 
And again, people with low calcium um, are going to be at risk for seizures. So nursing interventions are going to be seizure precautions. Talking to them about diet, um, eating foods high in calcium, low in phosphate, and cardiac monitoring. Treatment, obviously, if tetany is present, is going to be using IV calcium gluconate um, sedatives for seizure activity. Adrenal gland disorders, again, the adrenal glands sit on top of the kidneys. There are a couple different functions of the adrenal glands. The cortex, which is the outer side, um, is, activate, is activated by ACTH from the anterior pituitary, and the medulla is actually going to be stimulated by the SNS to produce catecholamines, which are going to be your epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. So this is the part of the endocrine system is actually neurologically regulated, which is kind of pretty cool. Um, so the roles of the adrenal glands is to help with fluid balance, um, and also um, a lot of our fight and flight responses. It has um, to do with our stress response. Um, so if different areas um, being affected of the adrenal glands will have different sim uh, symptoms. Um, so if there's a problem with like the aldosterone or um, cortisol or androgens, you might see changes in voice, hair, or libido. If it's just a problem with cortisol, we might see um, problems of like Cushing's. Um, or if we think uh, it's the medulla, um, they'll have more neurological symptoms. Uh, think more like brain, like headache, anxiety, nervousness, um, tachycardia, and sweating with kind of like the fight or flight. So this um, is a tumor. Um, it can be a rare disease in those uh, who are hypertensive. It's a phenochromocytoma. It's a tumor of the adrenal glands. It can cause a hypertensive crisis. So signs and symptoms um, are, are known as the five H's, just because you have to remember the medulla is affected. So we're going to have severe hypertension, headache, hyperhidrosis, which is excessive sweating, hypermetabolism, and hyperglycemia. Uh, obviously, the way to combat it is remove the tumor. So the big thing that you want to watch um, of all these symptoms um, that can be dangerous for a patient is going to be the hypertension because, uh, you know, um, unmanaged severe hypertension can lead to um, stroke uh, or cardiac issues. Addison disease um, is going to be a condition where there is an insufficiency um, of steroids basically in the body. So this is going to um, be the opposite of Cushing's. So Cushing's we have a too much cortisol. Now with um, Addison's we have a problem with cortisol. So we have a decrease in inflammatory response, um, increase in fat metabolism, and a raise in serum glucose. But we also have a problem with a decrease in aldosterone which helps with fluid regulation, with sodium and water uptake, uh, reabsorption, and the excretion of potassium, and also our androgens, our sex hormones. So these patients can have a problem with decreased uh, serum um, sodium levels and have high potassium levels. So with Addison's, um, it is pretty rare. We're not going to see a lot of patients with these. So the signs and symptoms that you want to be aware with, um, obviously later stages are going to be the skin pigmentation, like I have off to the side there. Um, low blood pressure, low um, glucose levels. Um, a lot of times can have some instability with their emotional state, can suffer from depression, some uh, almost like a cognitive fog, 
um, for these patients. A lot of times, too, when somebody's going into an Addison's crisis, um, they're going to have some weakness. Um, a lot of times they'll talk about having, like, weak legs, like their legs are going to give out from underneath them. Um, but the problem is, is that they can become severely hyponatremic um, and go into a seizure um, and uh, coma. So crisis, uh, treat the um, treat them for the hypovolemia um, before they go into complete shock. Um, so it's going to be fluid and electrolyte replacement, hormone replacement, and obviously avoiding individuals um, with infection and any kind of strenuous uh, exercise or stressful situations because if they have an insufficiency of steroids uh, they're going to have to self-regulate and that's very difficult to manage to figure out what or how much steroids you need to replace to deal with stressful situations or illness. Cushing's is a little bit of a deja vu. Um, like I said, it's a pituitary disorder too, but this could be a problem just with the adrenal gland itself. Or, um, like I've mentioned several times, somebody who overuses steroids for a long period of time um, can kind of perpetuate this. So make sure you review those uh, signs and symptoms again. Some other symptoms is the virilization, where it's appearance of masculine traits and the recession of feminine traits. Diagnostics are going to be um, an overnight death of methasone suppression test. And obviously the way to kind of go about it um, to treat is to do a surgical removal of the adrenal gland. In terms of nursing, what we need to do um, helping these patients is promote safety, preventing infection, promoting skin integrity because of the thinning skin, and promoting body image. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the two for those who like that. All right, I know you're a little stressed out. What can you do? Wallow in self-pity until you can wallow no more, or ice cream until you can ice cream no more. Um, I hope this has been a good overview for you. If you have any questions, certainly you know how to find me, and I wish you the best, and God, I hope you love the endocrine system as much as I do. Miss P out.